You're listening to the Speaking Tongues podcast. I'm your host, El Sharice. Each week, I sit down to a conversation with multilinguals where we discuss and celebrate language, life, and culture through our own perspectives. Episode 70, Speaking Kalakichi with Sun Michelle. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Tongues. This episode is going to be a bit different than the others. I am honored to introduce Sun Michaud, who is Harvard University's first and only Gullah language instructor, where he teaches a curriculum based on extensive research and his own personal Gullah Geechee knowledge and experience. Sun is a Gullah Geechee native originally from South Carolina. He is not only a Gullah instructor, but also an activist and advocate whose work has been featured on HBO Vice, the BBC, and Al Jazeera, among others. Sun has cultivated an online presence via social media with frequent viral content ranging from pop culture commentary, allegorical anecdotes and entertainment to serious discussions, advocacy, and philanthropy. He uses his content to promote intellect, ethics, enlightenment, and education and considers media presence to be an integral component in his effort to draw attention to the oft ignored social groups, particularly the Gullah Geechee community. Welcome to the show, Sun. How are you today? Thank you, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I am good. How want if I do? <laughs> I'm so happy to have you here and to talk about Gullah Geechee and your culture and the language. And as I said, this is not going to be my typical structured episode because we have a lot to talk about. So I just want to jump right into it. Um, Get it. <laughs> let's start by situating the listener. Um, for those of us who have heard the words Gullah, Geechee, or Gullah and Geechee separately, um, mm -hmm. but don't know what the term refers to, tell us what it is. Um, are we talking about a language? Are we talking about people who speak a language, um, a particular culture, or both? Uh, both, all of the above. Um, it, in, a, in a sense, it's like when um, someone is French, um, speaks French, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something like that. Um, and, in, in a similar sense, that's, that's like Gullah is the culture it is the, uh, you know, the cuisine, it is the people, it is the language, um, it is all of it. Um, uh, the same can be said for, um, for Geechee, except that the term, the use of the term Geechee and, and uh, Gullah is somewhat regional. Um, to make that make sense, uh, we are primarily located in what is called the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Um, okay. And that's... Uh, uh, a strand of land from say about Wilmington, North Carolina, about 35 miles inland, and then forms a strip down to about uh, Jacksonville, Florida, um, which will include North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, parts of okay. those. Okay. And in different parts of the, uh, that, that region, um, say closer to the Georgia, Florida um, portions, um, they typically identify as Geechee more so than um, Gullah, but Gullah Geechee is used interchangeably because you're referring to um, essentially the, the, the same people, same common culture. Um, and so that's that's where we get the term Gullah Geechee from as, it's, as, as it is used here in the States. Um, but there's also, uh, you know, indigenous and also obviously, um, you know, African origin when we're referring to where um, our African ancestors came from um, would be the um, west coast of Africa, um, what was called the Rice Coast, um, and located primarily around the Sierra Leone, um, where the Gola people are, um, the Geechee people are. Um, and so that's where you get a lot of that lineage. And of course, we weren't uh, allowed to be, we were banned from being um, literate in in the new language of English. And so uh, many of the words and terms and phrases that carried over or so-called loan words carried over from Africa were preserved um, phonetically the way okay. that it sounded. And so once you take those um, African words and try to translate them into writing when we are, um, when we did start writing in the language, 
we wrote a lot of it the way that it sounded based on English uh, rules. And so that's where you get the G-U-L-L-A-H as opposed to say G-O-L-A um, mm. for Gola. Okay. So do we know where specifically the language came from? What, I guess, language families kind of make up the the language as it's spoken and as it has been spoken in the United States over time? Well, the, the short answer is um, yes, but in the same sense that we know how all languages um, come about. Um, you know, English is not a language in and of itself that just kind of you know, came about by way of like spontaneous combustion, no matter what a lot of English speakers insist upon, um, which they seem to believe like, oh, no, 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 English was just born whole, right. already an adult language that didn't <laughs> derive from anything. Um, but, but all languages evolve from some form of communication before it, it's like some, some community system of communicating that came before it, whether it's, it's words, you know, or, you know, well, well all, you know, they're, they're all sounds of some kind, even if it's percussion, but um, in that sense, uh, there's of course the English side, it's, it's, it's an English based um, Afro indigenous Creole, um, the base coming from the fact that it's the lexifier of the colonizer who imposed it upon us. So, um, you know, we, we were forced to speak the language. And so that ends up being the basis for the language um, is English. And that's why uh, a lot of English speakers can um, understand a lot of the words that we, and phrases that we have in common because it's a, it's a Creole right. um, in that regard. Um, and so you want, if, if you go down the rabbit hole of where English came from, that's a whole, you know, Latin and Germanic languages, you know, there's, there's that part of it. Um, but what, what's less often explored is the African um, origin of our language and also the indigenous influences um, of our language. Um, I'm from a place where very many, like you, you, you see how uh, out West you see a lot of uh, cities and places, roads, things like that, that have uh, Spanish names, right. um, you know, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, you know, you know, like all of those um, have Spanish names. Well, I'm from a place where there are a lot of indigenous names, you know, um, Wadmala, you know, uh, Wando, um, a lot of these uh, names are actually names from the indigenous tribes um, that were there and including some of the names that we use, you know, like, you know, Wanda. A lot of names that people think are made up black names, mm -hmm. um, which all names are made up, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. But, you know, all names are uh, made up, but um, are actually from our indigenous roots. And in fact, um, with the Ogeechee River, um, that is uh, considered to be one of the possible inspirations for the name Geechee is like the Ogeechee River, hmm. um, including um, the Gwale people, you know, uh, being one of the, uh, the, the theorized influences for Gullah. And so that is also a part of the indigenous influence. Now, of course, there's a divide among um, some within the community as to what percentage of, of our lineage is African versus indigenous, um, et cetera. That's a debate for another time, but um, there, there is influence from both sides. So um, the languages that went into it creating Gullah, um, if you think about the circumstances that the language was created, um, what we're talking about is uh, something that began on continental Africa, uh, contrary to popular belief, the beginnings of the language didn't begin on the plantation. The ingredients, <laughs> so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, the ingredients for the gambo will come from someplace, from somewhere else, it came together um, in the sea islands and, and, and the low country, um, and, and, uh, you know, spread out, uh, throughout the region, including the Caribbean, by the way, but we'll get to that. Yes. <laughs> you know, but the, the beginnings of it, um, as a pigeon began in Africa and it formed into a Creole in the United States, um, from a pigeon. So um, to make the distinction, um, I'm sure your audience already knows this, but 
you know, hey, I'll just <laughs> say just for the record, uh, the distinction between a pigeon and a creole, um, a pigeon being essentially a utilitarian form of speaking um, that uh, language that takes multiple languages, perhaps, you know, two languages and blends them in a way for both speakers of each, each individual language to be able to communicate with one another. But it's not necessarily um, a whole language of its own. In a sense, it's kind of like Spanglish. Mm. Um, but then a Creole is once those two languages come together and start to create their own individual rules. Um, you take some from here, some from there, put them together, and then you come up with this third set of rules that doesn't necessarily adhere to either one of the languages. And you continue to do that. Um, and if it survives a generation, that very next generation of the of speakers of that pigeon are now speaking a, a, a Creole, a language that's mature and adult language of its own. And as time goes on, um, you'll start to see uh, more independence from both of their languages, uh, but they'll still favor you know, like, oh, you favor your mama, you know, you know, <laughs> you know you, they'll still you show favor to where it came from. And you, you, can, you can see a lot of that in Gullah now. It still shows um, very strong favor to our African um, lineage. And unfortunately, that's something that when you live in a broader context that favors English as the uh, dominant language, um, and you hear you are speaking this very Africanized uh, language with accent and all, um, that's gonna be stigmatized as, uh, and associated as, 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 as ignorant and uneducated, um, unsophisticated. It's not a prestige language or prestige right. accent, um, so to speak. And so that might influence uh, some people's willingness to, uh, associate themselves with the language or to speak it fluently. And, and we see some of that even with like first generation immigrants where you might have a friend that you didn't even know was Nigerian. <laughs> like I had no idea this dude was from Ghana. Like, whoa, until they go home, you go home with them and, and listen to their parents. It's like, wow, you really mastered this sort of English, um, you know, shush you know, way of speaking, this Yankee, Yankee speech. Um, and because they understand what happens when they go to school, when they go to work, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they get it. Um, and that, so just imagine that happening over the course of generations, um, separating people from their mother tongue, but you don't actually have your African mother or father in the house with you to remind you of it. So that's kind of what we're doing. It's a miracle that so much of our Africanness is still preserved in the language and the culture, be, given that um, how, the, the, the space that's been put between us and our African origins. Right. And that's what I want to ask you. Like, do you feel like you said earlier, the regions where um, Gullah Geechee uh, survives and it, it persists to this day, right. Right. Um, do you feel like the geographic area has any has played a role in its ability to uh, continue on. It has everything to do with it. Um, the the language, a part of the reason that the language was able to survive, as is, is because of the isolation to which we were subjected uh, in plantation scenarios. Um, mm -hmm. Say, for example, with the uh, Sea Island plantations. There's there's uh, saltwater and freshwater Geechee, all right? There's saltwater gully, freshwater gully. There's wow. people who are on the coast and people who were inland. Okay. And so um, those who were saltwater were, um, there's no, no, no bridge, no ferry, no nothing for them at the time. They're just relegated to these islands and these communities to which, you know, access was, was very difficult um, to, to, you know, to, to, you know, uh, traverse. And so that plus the fact that many of the overseers and the uh, slavers were just simply not um, well equipped. They were just too weak to, to, to survive and deal with and cope with the climate um, that many of our ancestors were already acclimated to from Africa. We, we were already acclimated to marsh and, and, you know, just mosquitoes and humidity. And I mean, that's 
son. I mean, <laughs> how we roll. So, so we 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 were good. That's part of the reason that that they took people from regions that were somewhat like the regions that they were going to trans um, transport us. Um, you know, and that resulted in the states and the colonies resulted in us having extended periods of time with relatively low to no oversight, like very, you know, what they would call free time. It wasn't literally free time, but um, with little, you know, relatively less oversight, which allowed us to then be able to uh, speak more of our languages, hold on to more of our traditions, do more of the things that were in, uh, in alignment with what had been tr passed down from generation to generation. We were able to express those things right. uh, more freely and create um, vehicles for them, create Trojan horses for them to be able to be expressed in the presence of, of overseers um, who didn't realize that's what we were doing. Um, and so there that isolation and having that space um, really afforded us the um, control space to be able to do those, uh, to be able to do those things. Um, we have the control space to be able to do that and preserve it, um, but also to pass it on um, with less oversight than if we were say living in a city or someplace where we had to interact with overseers or the buckradim more commonly. You know, if we had to, if we had to interact with them more often, we would be monitored more and assessed more, and 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 you know, engaging more and having to adjust our behavior and our language more often. Um, and so, that's kind of what you see with um, African Americans who were dispersed um, further out into the, the 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 country because anywhere from you know nearly about three-fourths of the, of the black population that that um, were abducted and and transported to um, America came through the Charleston um, port right that's one of the reasons that it, it became um, so lucrative was obviously you know because of uh, slavery and as a shipping port and so the people who stayed in the area and near in the, in that region um, had more autonomy to be able to hold on to more of it, whereas people who were dispersed further away um, were put in um, you know, conditions alien to themselves and either acquiesced or adapted for survival. Mm -hmm. um, but we, 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 that's, you know, not a knock on them. That's just, you know, it's survival. Right. Um, it's the reason that I sound like this right now <laughs> <laughs> over the course of um, generations. Um, obviously the people in my families felt like it would be better for me to sound this way than for me to crack tea like this y'all when I talk <laughs> most of the time. Now I might sound like this y'all when I talk to my family or my friends or people that in um, different social situations, but for the most part, um, I will speak this way when I'm in professional settings for the most part. Not all the time. And that's not, that's not out of like pressure or like somebody's forcing me to do it. I just like being able to be bi and trilingual and switch whenever I feel like right. um, being understood uh, fluently by my audience. And then there are times when I just don't want to do that mm. um, and I can make that decision. But, it, 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 but my, uh, I digress. My point being that <laughs> that's a thing that we all experience in different regions of this country and even different parts of North America outside of this country, we experience that. Mm -hmm. I think it's like our superpower. It is. <laughs> it's one it of really, our superpowers, I should say. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really is. I mean, if, if you think about, like, there are so many things that a lot of people, like average, everyday Gullah Geechee people aren't aware of in regards of our own culture and our own history. Um, and that's not something that is on them. Like, that's, that's you know, oh, well, you know, if you pass it down, I pass it down how? Like, we, we already passed down so much of our culture, um, things that we don't even know are cultural. I mean, I, I, I grew up going to church every uh, New Year's Eve, you have a praying every New Year's Eve, that's how you will go ring in New Year's. You wouldn't go to a New Year's Eve party and none of that <laughs> firecracker like, nah, bro, you go to church. And um, you know, my daddy and my mom and all of them, you know, will miss, minister and missionary and we pray in church. Now, even if you hadn't been told to, 
the story to know the difference, that's watch night. That's a that's a a, a, a part that's a part of of Gullah Geechee culture um, for Freedom's Eve. It's it's when uh, marks uh, the the date of when Gullah Geechee people were among the first to be um, to receive the news of the Emancipation Proclamation. So um, you know we all know now that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't really free anyone. But that's 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 another whole, episode. <laughs> yeah, that's a different episode. But you know we were the first to be freed. Um, by way of news of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and they gathered on uh, that night uh, to be able to hear the news because there was a rumor going around that if you didn't hear it yourself in person that you wouldn't be freed. And so everyone gathered um, to, to receive that news. And that ended up being the thing that we now commemorate every year in two parts. We have watch night the night before, that's typically a, a, a pray in, a service um, complete with a traditional song that marks um, the, 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 you know, the, the marching of the watchmen coming to, to deliver the news. And then the following day, we have traditional meals on um, like Hop and John, greens, things like that for good fortune um, and good luck. And it's not made with black eyed peas. <laughs> it's not? No, that's not the traditional way. I've been it's, doing it wrong all these years. <laughs> it's field peas. That's and, and that's the thing is it's, it's wow. red field peas it was the original um, you know, hop and john. And um, you know, the black eyed peas. I mean, now you can make it with black eyed peas if you want to. You if you choose, hey, if you like it, I love it. But <laughs> the traditional gullet dish is not. Um, with black eyed peas, just with red field peas. Get out of here! Right. Wow. And and that is something that um, that you know people don't realize is in and of itself a carryover from our um, you know African one pot dishes, um, things like red rice, uh, mm -hmm. which is essentially Gullah Gullah's jollof rice. Right. Basically, it's essentially. Oh man. <gasps> yeah. All right, I gotta I gotta noodle on this a little later because <laughs> I'm just gonna. This is just an, as an aside, right? Um, my my dad would always make sure, like on New Year's, I don't remember if it's Eve or New Year's Day, mm -hmm. collard greens and black eyed peas, right? And I never even heard it called Hop and John until a few years ago, right. and I. I didn't like black eyed peas growing up. I like them now, but I didn't like them when I was a kid. Right, right, right. And I was just like, oh, dad, like, why we got to do this? Can we just like order a pizza or something? Can <laughs> we just, can we not do this? And like, I, I would ask my dad, like, where does this come from? Like, why is this important to you? Right. And it was just the way that it had always been done. And we're right. not Gullah Geechee, but um, it was just the way that it, it had always been done in, in the Southern tradition. So right. phew, my mind is like, oh, I got to I got to think about this. I got to not think about it because you just told me, but I have to. Right. Process I gotta, it. I got to process it. Let's <laughs> sink it. Yeah. Well, and, and I should say that one of the things that 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 about Gullah cuisine and about Gullah, Gullah culture in general, but but um, something that is encapsulated by the cuisine is is when we start to talk about what doesn't go in what, um, I remember um, a conversation with a, uh, a Cajun chef, a woman from New Orleans who was saying that we were making gumbo wrong. Like, you know, you don't put no corn in gumbo. You don't put no this and that in gumbo, you know? And, and you know, it turned into like a thing because the conversation was, we put whatever we want to in it. Right. Because it's what we have. Right. We, you know, we put what we have in it. Like, no, there ain't no Gullah Geechee people sitting around saying, well, you know, if only we had shrimp, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we could make ourselves like nobody's doing that, you know? And so if you got black eyed peas, you make, you make your hop and jam with what you got. And if in the event that you use black eyed peas, if you use Navy beans, whatever your thing is that you have available, if you don't have field peas and new day uh, and freedom, you know, emancipation day catches you without, field peas in your possession, you still make your beans and rice with whatever with whatever you have. Mm -hmm. um, we expand the, the culture, we expand the culinary arts and the cuisine. Um, and that is essentially the heart of the language. That's what it is. We don't have evil whole, ethic whole, 
You know what I'm saying? We don't have Hausa whole or Yoruba whole. We don't have these languages fully intact as our abducted ancestors spoke them. But we also don't even have English um, wholly and intact as it was presented to us. We influenced English as well. People love to talk about how this is an English-based Creole and how English influenced the way that we speak. Well, we, we influenced the way that English is spoken as well. Mm. And so that's the very nature of a Creole. It's a linguistic gumbo. And so we made use of what we had in order to, you know, express in ourselves and, and create something new. And so I'm not as much of a purist as others may be. I'm not like a gatekeeper that way. I, I believe you work with what you have to get to, 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 to have what you need. Mm-hmm. I think that's sensible. <laughs> I would have tore up your basically long story short. I would have probably tore up your your, your daddy's greens and Papa <laughs> John. I would have tore it up. So I mean, if you don't eat it, I'd have got your serving. A, a lot of you know Mexican and you know like cent- Central American um, cuisine was also influenced by African um, cuisine and 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 you know these rice dishes and things like that that a lot of people think you know, have always been, you know, uh, Mexican are actually dishes that were, were uh, carried over from our African, uh, you know, people. There, there's a, a, a community of Gullah Geechee people um, in Mexico as well. Um, and those who were um, fought through the Gullah Wars, um, you know, uh, and collaborated with the, the, uh, well, the, the indigenous people there for the Black Seminoles, um, you know, John, you know, uh, uh, cultural heroes like John Horse, um, who fought and ultimately uh, negotiated a truce to move out west, um, and you know have set up a, a community there, and then end up migrating down to um, Mexico. When of course the United States government double crossed them, like we knew they would, mm. um, you know. And so there are influences. Our influence extends further into other cultures and other, you know, other races, other countries than people are aware of. And so, um, yeah, when you, when you start, you know, talking about rice and beans and, you know, (laughs) you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, that, that extends a a lot further. And so, you know, it, that's, that's important. The reason that that's important to know is not just for ourselves, but for our contributions to be known um, and associated with who we are as people so that people can then have, you know, an increased sense of value for not only us as human. First of all, just being, just to be clear, just being human is enough. Like just, just being a person is enough. Although being any form of life is enough, but still being a human being you know, should be enough for them to value our, and, 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 and uh, our humanity. But I think that once it's also pointed out that not only are we just people who should be valued just on a human level, um, we're also responsible for very many of the things that make your, 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 your lives nice. We nice up your life. And that's one of the things that you have to take in, into consideration. If you imagine life without us, you know, in what? And so that's the thing is, is, is the more of us who know that and the more of us who can embrace that, um, I think that that comfort level from within the community can really go a long way to destigmatizing our language. And with the destigmatization of our language, we'll be able to um, assimilate into spaces without acquiescing mm. to things that are, you know, not aligned with who we are culturally. Right. right. We can do that. Yeah. As you mentioned, um, that this is a language that we're talking about. So let's talk about some parts of the language structure that stand out, um, including grammar rules, loan words, orthography, and other ways in which the language is accented. Um, if I'm listening to someone speaking Gullah Geechee, like what are some things that I would hear um, that would let me know that this is the language that I'm listening to? Um, if somebody say, um, if I listen for somebody, I crack tea like Gullah Geechee, uh, we're gonna let me know I forget in a language, um, you know, Gullah Geechee, mm-hmm. you know, um, and the same thing, you know, where 
some of the basics. Uh, say, for example, with the accenting. Um, some it, it, <laughs> well, actually, I'll, I'll start with some of the things that that is that are usually the the most difficult for people who aren't native speakers to pick up. Mm-hmm. Um, now, of course, look, I already know my uh, uh, Caribbean it, it, out of diaspora. Y'all can just sit this one out because y'all oh, that's how we sound when we talk. That you know, you sound you know, like you're from here. Like I know, I know, I know. I'm talking about <laughs> for people who don't. Um, you know, come from uh, the part of the diaspora who sound the, the, the way that we do. But that being said is there are common things um, like, say, for example, um, B-E-N-D and B-E-N-T, okay, and B-E-N and B-E-E-N all sound like Ben. Hmm. So in that sense, we will uh, drop the D, we'll soften the T. And if I'm saying that, um, you know, who bent um, this? And your response is that someone named Benjamin bent it. Or that someone, Benjamin named Benjamin, bent it a while ago. And I say, Ben Banham. Mm. Ben Banham would be that Ben bent it. Well, we ain't Ben Banham. Man, Ben Ben Banham. Is he ban bun ban him? Now in that situation, in that sentence, I'm either going with ban or bun, and that's also regional. If certain parts of uh, the region that ban turns into a bun, mm. and I've noticed that the bun is closer to saltwater um, Geechis, who are people who are closer to the um, the islands in the low country, and as you venture out. Um, you'll start to hear the uh become an eh. So bun becomes ban. Um, fush as opposed to fish um, are some of the things, that, uh, the, the features of the accent. Um, and these are some of the ones that you'll also um, see, like it's a non rhotic language, so we drop our R's. And so yard would be like yard. Um, and that also pertains to when there is an R, when there is an um, R in a sentence, we might just either drop the R and double the vowel, excuse me, uh, drop the consonant, double the um, the, the vowel. So uh, it goes from sounding like Y-A-R-D to Y-A-A-D, from yard to yard, um, to yard. But there's also the ah, ah, like, you know, or the, like the, uh, you know, lot trap, you know, vowels or whatever, where you go from um, God to Gad, and from um, port to pat, a pun, pen, like, you know, is pane, in a pun it, as in upon it or mm-hmm. on it. And so you hear that happen. And some people might say, well, I don't really notice that a lot in my language. Like, you know, when when do we do that? You know, I, I've done a video recently and, and I talked about, you know, pot, pat, um, switches place, you know, pat, pot, um, can, uh, alternate places. And people say, well, I never do that. Or, I don't do that in my language. I said, okay. All right. Well, have you ever heard someone say, yeah, dang. You know, like, yeah. I was like, okay, well, that yeah is God. Like you're saying, you're going from saying God, to yeah, you know, like that. And that's what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. And so in the, similarly, we will switch out the k percussive sound, like the k for the g sound. And so You'll hear, um, like even with the word um, Geechee, which you know um, is spelled with a K, um, in in its other form of K I S S I, is pronounced G E E C H E E, because of that alternate alternating the K and G sound. You'll see that more prevalently when you hear someone go from, um, you know, like God dang to God dang, mm. and you hear that G turn into K. And that's something that you also hear alternating between languages like um, Bohemian Creole English, bo- Bohemian, uh, you know, Bohemian Creole English. Like, and I know a lot of people say, you're still saying Bohemian. No, I'm not saying Bohemian, like Bohemian Rhapsody. I am literally saying Bohemian, but in our language, the ah sounds like a all sound. So it sounds like I'm saying Bohemian. And um, 
and the the hamian is a he mm. uh, sound so it's it's the accenting to go from bohemian to bohemian because when you hear somebody say mama that's your mama house as opposed to is that your mama's house you know is that um whose box is that who box that is mm. so when you go bahama bohama box box mm. it's in the accenting and you'll still hear words like you know bunky and bungi are the same word the only difference is like the g and the k in the middle of it but it's literally the same word and some people say oh it's, it's almost the same as different words but kind of similar like, no 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 it's literally the same word we just enunciate them differently in different regions and that's not like a I mean, some sort of coincidence we have these forms uh, these words in our language um in common um because we literally have shared ancestries like shared lineage like the when I say lineage, I don't mean just like generally speaking. I mean, literally, the people from this region were transported to another region and took their language with them. Um, after the Revolutionary War, we have loyalists who leave uh, the low country and colonies and and take, you know, and uh, our abducted ancestors with them to the Bahamas. And with them, they bring their language. And you also have people in the Caribbean who are being um, brought from the Caribbean to the low country. And so you have, uh, it's kind of like the chicken or the egg thing, like, hmm, so does that mean that our accent came from here and went to there or went from there to came to here? Like, that? Nah, don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, but it's it's been cycling back and forth um, for generations to the point where when people finally hear um, Gullah Geechee people talk, um, people from Guyana and people from, you know, the Bahamas and Barbados and all of them say, man, you sound like you, you local, boy. You sound like you showing you from around yet? No, well, yeah, technically no, but you know, <laughs> what you're hearing is not a figment of your imagination. Right. And it's so funny because, I mean, I told you this before we started recording, but um, my mother's family is from the Bahamas. So when I first came upon your content and I listened to you talk and I listened to your accent, I was just like, yeah, he, he sounds Bahamian. Like, it's just... Yeah. I hear it so much. And that's probably why I'm always like smiling because I'm like, oh, it's like it's a familiar accent to me. And it makes me like, you know, oh, it's like, yeah. um, but I want to ask you as far as um, and I let me before I before I go further, I want to say that um, from what I've noticed, um, I've always heard people say like Bahamians sound completely different from their Caribbean neighbors and they're just the accent is it's it, kind of in a way like how Bayesian sounds so different from like everybody else and I really hate when people do that like generic fake Caribbean yeah mom right. accent right. and it's just yeah. like it doesn't really encompass all of us and and the the, the island differences and the regional differences are so strong but um, I do hear such a, such a strong correlation. Like if I didn't know that you were, that you were Gullah Geechee, I would say, okay, he's, he's Bahamian. It's, right. you know, it's cool. Um, but I want to ask you, I guess, where do you see the similarities specifically between Gullah speech and language um, outside of the Bahamas, as you know, you already discussed, but like, where do you see those correlations in other parts of the Caribbean? Um, it's it's literally throughout the Caribbean, even in um, Jamaican patois. Some people, I, I think, people who are not Caribbean and 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 are not familiar with the languages, when they when they hear somebody from Charleston talk, the first thing they say is "You Jamaican," because they, they 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 ain't really familiar with the Jamaican accent, mm -hmm. and so and you ain't really familiar with the uh, with the Gullah Geechee accent either, and so that's all you know. And so you'd be like, oh, you from Jamaica? Like, you start listening to all different Caribbean um, islands or whatever. They never even heard of you know, a lot of them. You know what I'm saying? And so they just go with the first thing they ever, you know, they ever hear. Like, when like people say, oh, you sound like you're from Africa. Really? Which part? Well, I know what part. <laughs> I don't know which part you sound like you're from, but you just sound African. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Africa's a whole continent. I don't, I can't sound like I'm from the whole continent of Africa. You know, uh, so people just they they go with what they know. And so they just ask you like, oh, man, you know, you, 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 you know, most people can't tell the difference between a Scottish or Irish 
or you know british accent like you know or or australian accent you know so um you know or new zealand for that matter like so so they right. just rounded off to whatever sounds the closest to the thing that they heard before that sounded different um but the people who speak the language know and so for example if you have um somebody who uses the term fi all right fi or fa fi fa fo these are all going to be used in different ways even though they sound very similar if somebody say um you know is for them um it is for them mm. or it is theirs either you're showing ownership or it's or it's theirs um if you're saying um is for true and somebody saying that is true that is the truth um for them so fi and fo goes um from being uh, in that instance, even if I say for true, doesn't really make sense in English. Like in an English sentence, you wouldn't say that's, well, that's for true. Um, that wouldn't really, really make sense. But for us, it does because it's attributing truth, right? to attribute truth, like to give truth to, um, in a sense, for true. And this is for you, Funo. It's for you. And somebody said, whoa, hold up now, you know, now we're talking to Patwa or Gullah. Well, we both use Una for you. So if something is for Uno here and it's for Uno there, these are very similar, well, virtually identical, but they're from two different places. That's That would be your Jamaican connection, um, Jamaican uh, Gullah connection there. Um, but at the same time, uh, if somebody is saying uh, that Nyam, you know, game something for Nyam would be, again, something that you hear in uh, Jamaican Patwa, something that you hear in Gullah. And with Bohemian Creole English, it's, I don't think the average person who hasn't heard us side by side knows just how almost virtually interchangeable they are. And until like it, you go there, like you know, like like uh, I get off the plane in Nassau, and it's like boy, you sound like no Charles around you. Like everybody sound, you know, it, it was like eerie just how similar it was to what I already knew, mm. and eerie in a sense that I went through my whole school years being told lies about the way I sounded, not knowing there was a whole region full of people who sounded just like I did. Right. So it's easier to make the case that the way you sound is um, some sort of uh, a symptom of your, your lack of education or some sort of stigma or um, just, just an anomaly, and you're like, well, that wasn't supposed to happen. You just, just, just an accident that you sound that way. You were supposed to sound the other way. Um, okay, but then how you explain all these million people that, that sound the same in this region? Yeah, how do you, how you, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've had uh, sat down and had, I've had workshops and classes with people from Guyana, and um, we we just get to going back and forth. And I said, okay, let me let me do. Let me try this real quick. Let me go ahead and give you um, uh, a pop quiz. Um, and I said, okay, then um, if somebody been going um, somewhere and um, ain't get back to 40 in the morning, okay, what time did they get back? Did they get back after? Oh, what, do you want to do it? Because I saw you processing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let me take let me take a guess. I'm I'm you know okay. So. Okay, what 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 time is four day in the morning? Oh man, I feel like it's not a time. What time would that be? Yeah, what what would be the block of time? I would say between midnight and sunrise. Your Technically correct. <laughs> Technically, 
except that closer to sunrise would be day clean. Mm -hmm. That would be like a break of dawn would be day clean. Um, Four day in the morning would be after midnight, usually around like say two, three, four ish, not quite sunrise. It's the, it's the witching hours, the wee hours of the night. Oh, okay. Um, And night would be evening, just night. It, it, it wouldn't be night. It's like just a scrap night would be evening. <laughs> so when somebody say they can see you this evening, that means that they're going to see you um, this, at night. So if somebody says this evening, this evening, this evening, you know, that's this evening or good evening. Right. But, um, and that's, that's in your, in your nighttime and four day in the morning will be um, late after 12, like well after 12. So somebody said, don't, Hey, don't be coming around in this house. Yeah. No, four day in the morning now. That means you better not be into this house like well after after midnight, around two, three o'clock. Don't don't do that. Um, but if somebody say you got to have, um, you know, uh, be up around um, come day clean. That means that, you know, by the time five, five, six, you know, ish come, you need to be up and out already uh, right. before, by the break of dawn. And then, of course, there's, you know, there's there's morning and um, as well. And so. People who. It's it's literally before day in the morning, mm. full day in the morning, morning. before day in the morning. Got it. Okay. And so that's the thing is is so that's why I was saying you're technically technically <laughs> right in a sense that it is before day in the morning, but it's a specific <laughs> block of time um, in the morning. Okay. Um, in 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 the wee hours. And so uh, if someone you know says you know, even looks sporty and he's not go to meet in there. You know, what would be Sunday go to meeting? I've heard that phrase, but I never knew what it referred to. Your your best attire, your best clothing. Okay. Because people from praise house culture associate going to church with wearing their Sunday best, so to Mm. speak. Okay. And so Sunday go to meeting would be your Sunday best or the best clothing that you have. So if somebody says you've been looking sporty, that means that you were looking really good in your very nice clothing. Oh man. You know, and so a lot of the language and a lot of the phrases come from things that you you visualize. Like you 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 see some something happening, um, and somebody say, you know, well, um, <clears throat> you go to your <laughs> you 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 know you had a half a cup of Kool-Aid and now you got a quarter cup of Kool-Aid when you get back mm. and ain't nobody drink your Kool-Aid, you know? Okay. Then I, we, you know, I can stop that door from sucking eggs. So you just put out, you put out some Kool-Aid, but no sugar in it. You about to see who been drinking your Kool-Aid. Cause somebody could be like, yeah, I ain't Kool-Aid nasty. <laughs> <laughs> see there. I didn't catch you. I catch you. You know? So, but if you say I can stop that dog from sucking egg and, and, and sometimes stop wouldn't even have the answer to be, you know, I could top that dog from um, sucking egg. Um, it means that I'm going to put a, put a stop to this thing that is happening. Um, this, this uh, undisclosed sort of thing. And, and that's a farm reference mm. um, because dogs would sneak into the, to the chicken coop and steal eggs on the low. Oh. Um, sometimes they would be, you know, smart enough to know better than to eat the chicken but they'll still eat the egg. And um, so that's essentially you saying that I'm going to put an end to this thing that is happening under, under the guise of secrecy. You know, mm-hmm. you're going to expose a, a, a thing. Okay. And, and so those are some of the, the, like the colloquialisms. And then there's some that, that I haven't heard anywhere. I haven't heard anybody say parito. If somebody say, you know, um, you know, somebody is knock me. Mm. Um, you know, I'll knock me one day, you knock me and parry too. You know, that is in reference to your feet mm. being the, the positioning of your feet. Like when you stand still, the position of your feet being out. Now I talked about it with my sister and my sister and I were going back and forth about the etymology of it. And she was saying, I believe it's parrot toe, like as in feet out going outward um, because that's what the position of the feet um, look like. Wow. And um, that she believes it's, it's parrot toe. Now, if that's wrong, I'll take it up with my sister. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it makes logical sense because that, that is the reasoning that we put into everything is there's usually some sort of very visual um, thing to it uh, or some sort of thing that's, that's connected to nature, something that's carried over 
um, into our language and we, we constantly uh, you know, convert those things into these phrases that make it easy for us to understand. Because remember the way that we were learning English, um, we were not sat in a class and taught English. We right. were taught English in way of our, our real live circumstances um, in situations and we were trying to figure out how to convert a thing we just saw or something that we need you to do um, you know, into a phrase that is easily understandable in absence of a, a vast vocabulary in that foreign language that we're learning in English. And so it needed to make sense, um, you know, right away. So if somebody says, you know, hey, um, don't take no wooden nickel now. Mm -hmm. If I don't want you to take no wooden nickel, then I don't want you to be deceived by something that appears to be something that is not something of, of value that is not value valuable um or just don't 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 be don't get duped um a wooden nickel is a very obvious you know counterfeit you know nickel it's a very obvious thing um to to make that make sense mm -hmm. um and then some of them you know for the most part end up being things that we just take for granted if somebody say you know got you know a peasy head one nick and like, okay, well, peasy, peasy how? Like, you know, like little tight little knots, curls or whatever, like peas in the kitchen. And that's the kitchen in the back of our, in the nape of our neck is the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, peas in the kitchen. And so those are things that end up being common phrases that we don't even really give a second thought anymore um, as to what they mean. But if you start unpacking some of those things, like, wait a minute, you mean to tell me all this time I've been saying... <laughs> 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 you know, it, 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 like the like the 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 egg corns in the language were like, you know, hold up, y'all saying chest of drawers. I thought even chest of drawer. They like who chest of? <laughs> I know who chest of been. I thought even chest of draw though. <laughs> That's funny. Mm -hmm. That is really interesting. So interesting. Even though I did my research. And I read a lot of things. I, this is so interesting. I, <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I just, I love this kind of stuff. So within the community, um, mm -hmm. you talked to me previously about um, the concept of understanding where a culture sits based on their words for things, um, things that include gender, um, race, um and other i guess cultural qualifiers and things that that make us a society right. um where i i want to talk about these terms in in gala language and and culture and perhaps how they evolved over time and and maybe how they're continuing to evolve right um one of the one of the things um i was having a conversation with my students about um being able to execute the language in a contemporary context, like how to use it now. Um, my focus in teaching the language is in traditional Gullah, like, like um, it's the way that maybe your grandmother or great grandmother would, would have sounded. Um, not so much contemporary Geechee, like contemporary Gullah, which would be um, Geechee, but that is also included. But um, to make it make sense in language, you'll have your um, acrylic, mesolec, basilic. And traditionally, what that represents is the acrylic would be the most um, you know, assimilated, sort of most educated form of a language. So if you're speaking a Creole, it would be the, in, let's say you're speaking a, an African, Afro-Indigenous Creole, English-based Creole, and English is the lexifier. It is the one that is the language that is the foundation of it. It's the most anglicized version of that Creole, okay. closest to English, okay? Mesolek would be the combination of the two, like the um, other Afro, African indigenous languages, mixed in with English, um, kind of like the Spanglish sort of thing, but it's more so using um, your own rules mixed in with a lot of the English rules. So for example, um, oh, but before I give you an example, um, and, and best like would be 
the furthest away from the anglicized form. Okay. Okay. And, but Basilic is also considered the least educated. It's considered the least sophisticated, the least refined. Well, in my class, it's the other way around, where the elementary version of Gullo would be the most anglicized. It's the one that is the least complex, the least foreign from the English that you already speak, because it's not a complex form of the language um, as is. It's more anglicized. The intermediate would be the Masonite. And the advance would be the language in my class that in another class would be considered rudimentary. In an English class, my advance would be considered, um, would be stigmatized as, as, as not prestigious. Whereas in my class, the people in Mokrakti, like this, that's the prestige, <laughs> this the prestige the accent in my class. And so it's the, it's the opposite. Um, and one of the things that I, that I try to impress upon them is that the, the language is, is very fluid. It, it sounds different. Even native speakers speak it differently with one another. Mm. I ain't gonna sound the same way when I talk to my mom is the same way I talk to, you know, one of my friends. And then if I got me a little, you know, a little dip, a little mix, I can talk to, you know, them the same way I can talk to my boy. So we we all we all sound different. The same way you sound different when you talk to your pastor and, and then when you're talking to your boss or your coworker, mm-hmm. um, you don't sound the same. And so we we constantly, you know, code switching and 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 changing the way that we sound, even when we stay in the language, even when we stay in the accent. And um, that's important because it allows us to be able to grow the language, but then hold on to our roots at the same time. That to me is, is, is important. So what I try to do with the language and impress upon people, um, you know, people who, who decide to, uh, and to some degree, I guess it's a decision for people who are either trying to come back home. Maybe you used to sound that way, but you've been so used to code switching that you don't swap out your language and they don't sound that way. And it might even, some people even have imposter syndrome when they try to sound, use the accent again. It don't, it don't feel natural no more. And, um, and I've had conversation with them with people like that. They said they, they just can't do it. Mm-hmm. In their mind, they just keep hearing the corrections that they've been getting all them years. And so what I try to do is just bring in some fundamental things, um, is impressing upon people the importance of preserving the old language, but growing the language that you have as is. You don't have to, it don't have to be either or. Um, but you can do you can do both unless you out here talking to your grandmama the way you talk to <laughs> you know you know or June bucking down the street you know unless you're doing that I mean I don't roll like that but oh, yeah everybody different but um you know being able to 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 do that um, is what's important um, you know for me but I also think that it also shows the words and phrases in your language shows me who you've been in contact with. A lot of what your values are, a lot of what your, you know, ethics are. Like say, for example, um, I think I told you um, this before when I was talking to a friend of mine who speaks uh, uh, an indigenous language and I, that I asked them, what is their word for the N word? And they say, we don't have one. Like culturally, we don't have beef with black people. Like we don't, we don't, right. we don't see you that way so we don't really have a we don't have an n-word like our n-word would be the n-word it would we would have to actually co-opt it or borrow that word from outside of our language because our traditional language doesn't have that Mm. and so when you listen to there's a reason okay if you go someplace um to a remote island and they use the word Wi-Fi. You would assume, oh, they must mean something different. Yeah. Why, you know, Wi-Fi must mean something other than it can't mean it, like internet. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no internet here. Like, but but, but just for, hold up now. Where y'all get Wi-Fi from? <laughs> <laughs> you know, why why are these people talking about, you know, you know, PlayStation 5? Like, hold up now. Mm. Y'all got PlayStations? You know. <laughs> The only way they would have that in their language is if they had some kind of contact with it. Like, where did you get that from? Mm. 
And so that's language does that. Like language exposes a lot of like it's 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 your, your history. It's a time capsule in a sense that lets people know who you've been around, who you've been around, who you've been talking to. We are we are doing, you know, you got a word for that, you know. And so that's language will show that. And so in Gullah Geechee, as in one of the the the, the contemporary issues or social issues when people talk about uh, gender neutrality and non-binary and things like that. Um, and I'll hear sometimes, you know, gotta get you people like, oh, I'm gonna get mixed up in all our foolishness data. You know, he ain't mm-hmm. no, you know, anybody, we ain't got no mess like that day. You, your mommy, see, you, he's a gal, he's a, he's a man, he's a gal or whatever. Like, yeah, hold up, stop right there. That's a lie. Because we always had gender neutral terms. Mm-hmm. We always did. Um, and it's E. E is everything in Gullah. E is a person, a place, a thing, an event, a male, a female, it could be a baby, a dog, a cat. If somebody say, you know, um, did you get your son? Will you get your son for your, for, for your birthday? Um, oh, you get a puppy. A puppy? Where the puppy at? E in there with him. So in that sentence, if I say, E get a puppy for your birthday, well, where the puppy at? E in there with him. The puppy is in there with my with my kid, with him, with my son. But just a second ago, you said E get a puppy. So was E your son a second ago? And now E becomes the puppy in the very next sentence? Hmm. You know, well, how was the birthday party? Even good. Now E is the birthday party. You see what I'm saying? And so in that sentence, we utilize E for, for whatever we need it to be in that moment. And that includes gender. You know, um, he getting married, you know, he, he getting married um, at the end of the, um, the week. Who are you marrying? Um, oh, and now you can decide E would be he. And let's say she is, he's marrying Sheila, you know? And I say, who are you marrying? Sheila. Sheila, man, you know, he work at the um, he, he work at a, at the grocery store. Mm, okay, and so now he went from being the groom to being the bride, right? Because now I'm referring to the bride as he work at the grocery store. I don't have to say she, and you still know who I mean. And so when you start asking yourself, why was it? Because <laughs> clearly we're learning we're learning English. And in English, they have he and she. Mm -hmm. So why are these people, all these generations later, still using E for he, she, it, them, they, et cetera, et cetera? Why didn't we just roll with he and she? Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say that we don't use he and she. We do. Um, But there's there's a reason that we do hold space for certain phrases because it's an indication of where we were culturally in regards of how we perceive these roles. Right. And so you see a lot of people in Western culture or in, you know, the more you know, anglicized settings, you know, European anglicized settings who will insist that, you know, woman's place is in the kitchen, a woman do all the cooking. Except if you go to a Gullah Geechee gathering, mm-hmm. you'll see the man in the barbecue pit, the right. man cooking crab and oyster, a man in the kitchen cooking his, you know, whatever his prize dish or whatever. Um, if you, you jack leg Gullah Geechee man, if you can't burn something up in the kitchen, I mean, you, <laughs> you, know, you got to do something. You do you got to bring something more than mouth to the table when it comes to dinner time. <laughs> You know, so no, no, no. Like culturally, we don't do that. Right. You you got to do something, man. Grow, grow something, hunt something, do something. <laughs> you know, and so culturally, a lot of those traditional roles. I mean, again, we we are are being conditioned in a a white power structure that conditioned us with a lot of their values and 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 ethics, and we've adopted a lot of it. But if you take a look at the core of our community. Um, there's a lot of gender neutral things that aren't really specifically 
um, male or female. Growing up, if 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 there was a snake in a hen house or something that needed to, to, to get got or whatever, my mama just as quick to get the shotgun as anybody else. Mm. You go get the shotgun. My mama will fish to this very day. My mama go fishing. You know what I'm saying? And so you ain't just you know waiting around for no man to go get you some fish. You go get the fish yourself. You know, and and they they, they she'd be right around the house. Um, you know, if it come down to sewing something, um, bully on um chicken coop, you know, if um daddy would work, you know, sometime all the you know, 12, 14 or whatever hours a day, and uh mama needs something both, she'll bully so mm -hmm. and 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 he good too. I mean, and, and and like no um, you know, rig up, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, or like she's all kind of hack on my how and I like that he eat any he, he lies too. Mm -hmm. so there's just things that you don't have the luxury and the privilege to sit around um adapting alien ethics that don't serve you in a in alignment with your culture right and that's the same thing not only with your traditions and your skills but also with your language mm -hmm. is <clears throat> be careful what you adopt and put in your language that don't really that ain't really a reflection of your values or your ethics because you mess around and and uh, start fervently defending something as your own that don't even belong to you. Mm. And that happens frequently. Um, I understand that there are also many superstitions that mm -hmm. exist in Gullah culture. And one that I found in researching this, um, and you tell me if, if this is something I found correctly or incorrectly about mm. the practice of painting the porch ceiling blue um, right. and the significance of that which has also been um i want to say appropriated but maybe co-opted is also a, a good word um by white southerners as well in the tradition right. um how are gullah traditions expressed uh not traditions superstitions and traditions let's let's half and half that um, how are they expressed? And I guess also, how do you see them being appropriated? How do you see them becoming a part of the greater Southern culture? And maybe in ways that people from the South may have been doing something and don't even realize it comes from the Gullah right. culture and the Gullah community. Well, one example would be exactly what you just said, would be the, um, the colors of paint that southerners would use particularly in um you know downtown and and coastal cities where they would use this haint blue um and haint blue is a color that our ancestors would use to ward off spirits and same thing we have with the, the blue bottles um and hanging in a tree mm. um to capture uh these uh you know spirits as well um and you see them you know being sold um i i've i've been you know it's hard for me to even find blue bottles anywhere like wow. I'm, I'm trying to yeah like to try to find them and um when you do find a lot of them um they're in decorative stores or michaels or whatever and um and and they're you know they cost a lot more than they would have if you had just been able to just go collect some bottles and time up like our ancestors did. Um, and even the, you know, the color paint, they do it because it's traditional, like a traditional Southern thing, but they're not connected to the reason that it became a tradition. Mm -hmm. Like it's not your tradition. And so it would imagine, imagine, American people who are not of Chinese descent or culture having anything to do with them at all, um, doing those, um, you know, like they do the dragon dance when they, for traditional, for like New Year's or whatever, like just, you, you, we, we make our, our own paper dragon mm -hmm. and do the dance in, in parades and everything. And when someone says, you're like, oh, hey, so you're, you must be celebrating this thing, you know, of, of, you know, the Chinese culture and you get, you know, almost offended that it's associated with the people who created it. Mm. No, 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 no. This is different. They do a dragon. 
We do it almost like in uh, coming to America. That's McDonald's. This is McDowell's. <laughs> They oh, had the Big, Big Mac. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they got the Big Mac. We got the Big Mick. You know, that is not the same. It ain't the same. You know, um, and uh, like, but but we're we're so used to that. Like it is, it is so common and normal to be ripped off that we almost expect it. Mm. Because, well, it's inevitable. Mm-hmm. Um and so when you see our paints that we would mix ourselves and create or whatever to paint our house, people are like, why is that house mint green? Like, why is that house a big yellow house or a blue, like baby blue house? Or, you know, like, you know, like, you got to get you people got some strange color houses. That's why, because those colors are significant to things in our tradition. And then if you want to just really have a really rootsy sort of thing, then you you use the color too, but you don't know the history of the color um, outside the culture. Now, I will say this, if you are inside the culture and don't know the the, the, the meanings of the blue, so that so what? You in the culture, you don't even know everything, but is you're keeping a lot of the tradition that you will carry on, you may not know like academically, like nobody sat down and taught it to you, but you are the living embodiment of the culture. Mm-hmm. So you can't co-opt your own culture. So it, 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 oh, well, you don't know it. And then, and here comes, you know, the Bakrodem that with that then got a whole bunch of book learning about your culture. Did you know that the reason that this, don't be shame when somebody outside your culture come and tell you something you didn't know, but you embody mm-hmm. because you got something they never will. Right. The height of their knowledge or of or the information, the height of their information will never match the depth of your embodiment of the thing that they have to Google mm. or take some sort of, you know, you know, class in a, in a, in a school or university to know more about the thing that you already are. And so those, those, <sighs> What isn't co-opted? Like, you know, what the, the, who, who, the racist lady that got caught saying the N-word, um, um, the white lady using all the butter and everything. She got butter, Paula, everything is butter. Paula Dean. Paula Dean. Mm-hmm. Paula Dean will bootleg black dishes, dumb them down and turn them into, you know, uh, essentially junk food. Mm-hmm. She, she turned, our, our, you know, pile on the salt, the sugar, the fat, the grease, the butter, and then co-opt it as her own and call it Southern cuisine. They love calling something Southern cuisine. Mm -hmm. It's not Southern cuisine. It's Gullah Geechee cuisine. Right. It's Gullah Geechee cuisine that's been given this, had the label soul food slapped on it. But soul food, as we know it, has been turned into something that it is not. Like soul food, when you start talking about the big mac and cheese swimming in butter. That'll be the soul food dish. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, the fried chicken and all this other stuff that we associate with soul food. A lot of those things started out as Gullah Geechee cuisine. And there was a way that they were prepared that didn't have the same physical effect on the body, traditionally speaking, as what we turned into soul food and a part of the reason is because soul food was not fostered in the same environment as Gullah Geechee cuisine. Mm. Now, in certain instances, they did have parallels. Okay, they did. But soul food is a generic name for traditional foods that were much better for us and also were connected to the African roots and their origin. There was, it wasn't just that we did it. We actually had a presence of mind and a self-awareness of where it came from and why we do it this way. You see what I'm saying? There was a, a presence of mind and the self-awareness of when we plant certain things at night, when we plant certain things at certain times of day, um, you know, uh, when we would harvest those things, all of that went into the whole Gullah Geechee cuisine, our food ways. But it became easier to separate that us from the culture once we came up with this catch-all soul food because you can just go get that from church's chicken Mm -hmm. you can you can just go you can get you you can go get your soul food from 
any, any number of sources without questioning or even examining where it came from or the origins of it. But if you go to get traditional Jamaican food mm -hmm. or Cuban food and, and, you know, food that is still steeped in the culture and you don't do it right, you will get clowned out of town. Right. right. If you make, you got to try to sell a, a bogus beef patty. <laughs> what? Look at it, man. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. And it's it's the soul food is to gullah cuisine what Taco Bell is to traditional Mexican food. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it it is very similar. And and people be like, oh, you can't say that like soul food, like you know, you 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 trashing our traditions. We're like, no, 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 no. I'm not. What I'm saying is that. Gullah Geechee cuisine is what we think soul food is. Mm -hmm. Gullah Geechee cuisine actually is that thing. And when we have, and, and, and soul food is what we pretend Southern cuisine is. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of soul food being this bad thing. It's just that having that catch all has made way for people who are not a part of our culture to co-opt and sift off and siphon from our culture because they're not held to the same standards of Gullah Geechee cuisine to do it the traditional way, to know the things and the difference and why the ingredients are what they are. Like if you're, if you're out here pretending that what you're doing is Gullah Geechee cuisine, the bar is higher. Right. You see what I'm saying? But if you just cook and soul food, then you can, you, you know, you what can go jangles can, for that. Right. You, you can do that. <laughs> you can you can you can cut some corners and have, because you're not obligated to any one particular subset of the culture or any aspect of the culture. You don't you don't need to know mm -hmm. some of the things that you would need to know in order to be worth your salt as a Gullah Geechee chef. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so um, I don't, you know, I ain't gonna put nobody name out there, but I've had this conversation with some, some, some known Gullah Geechee, you know, uh, chefs who feel this way. Um, and maybe they don't always express it because I think that they don't want people to feel like they're being elitist, um, or that somehow being divisive, but, but we can't really, we can't just keep running into those terms. Anytime somebody says something that goes against, um, what's been normalized as, as our perception of a thing. Like, you know, that it, sure it's, it's, it, it doesn't um, necessarily get along and go along with the conditioned idea of what this thing is, but there's a there there. And it's, and if we accept it, if we open ourselves up to a new perspective, um, we can then, that doesn't mean we'll give up soul food, but we can raise the bar for soul food. Right. So you see what I'm saying? So understanding how soul food came to be and what's, been allowed to happen to it and its source being Gullah Geechee, cuisine, Gullah Geechee cuisine will then allow us to say, oh, okay, well, you know, I feel you, brother. In that case, instead of just letting, um, you know, Megan and, and Dak, <laughs> you know, uh, Chad and Dakota open their you know, soul food restaurant in our neighborhoods and sell us back our culture, you know, we'll set the bar a little higher. You know, there's a scene in, um, in Do the Right Thing where uh, Mookie asks, uh, Sally says, oh, you know, black people on the wall. You know, you, you're not the black people on the wall. Like, you know, you know, what's up? He's, 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 it's an Italian restaurant. It's a pizza shop. I got Italians on the wall. He's like, yeah, but you in, you, you in a black neighborhood. Like, you know, the black people on the wall, you know? In in that instance, it'll be like, you know what? I have had some food that was supposed to be soul food in certain establishments. You could strike a match on the meat. And I'm like, if this is what y'all passing off as brisket, mm -mm. you know what I mean? And and it's a no for me. <laughs> it's a no, bro. And that's why I get. The ancestors been like over my shoulder, like, see, and that's what you get mm -hmm. for coming in, in the first place. You deserve that brisket just now. Right. Um, 
And so I think it's just one of those things where the more we level up our understanding of origin and, and where things come from, and the fact that we don't always have to go back to Africa, we don't have to date everything back to Africa to, to find roots mm -hmm. for a thing. Because Gullah Geechee as a language is indigenous to the Americas. Right, right. You see what I'm saying? And that has value in and of itself. Of course. Now, you know, everybody's from somewhere. I mean, we're all from Africa in some way, <laughs> shape, or form. <laughs> Everybody everywhere is, is, is from Africa in some way, shape, or form. So, so, you know, there's that. But even in Africa, culture evolves. Like people migrate. People move from different places or whatever. It's not static. The people who live in, in, in modern day, wherever, you know, it is, uh, you know, small town Africa didn't always live there. Mm -hmm. So, so that migration and, and evolution and uh, growing of the language and the traditions like that happens everywhere, including um, the, the motherland. So don't discount it happening here. Um, it has meaning and value here. Mm -hmm. We, yes, we brought things over from Africa and we still have so much that we attribute to it and learn from it and gain from it. But we also gave back. Right. You know, you know, God bless the African, the continental African or whatever, but you know, God bless the African American too. And and the 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 the, the Afro Cuban, the Afro Latina, and, and wherever we are throughout the diaspora, mm -hmm. wherever you, you if you 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 are whether you subscribe to the term black or not, or whatever your your um identity may be throughout the diaspora. You know, I got nothing but love for all of your contributions because we're in this together. Right. We're all dealing with the, with the, with the common conditions in many instances, considering how we even got, how the diaspora came to be for many of us. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and so that's, that's what's important about that is making sure that we know the difference between traditions and conditions. Mm -hmm. That we know that, that, that our, our tradition isn't simply to whoop kids because we think it's the best idea. It's that in many instances, you have to ask yourself, if I believe that if my child leaves this yard, that on the opposite side of this fence in the wilderness are wolves who will eat them. And someone says, under those conditions, what would you do when you see your child on the opposite side of the fence? Would you just reason with them and tell them, okay, now that you've gone on the opposite side of the fence, no two scoops of ice cream for you after dinner. Or would you take a stick and inflict as much pain as possible on the child so that they associate pain with the other side of this fence? And hopefully that pain that they feel right now will stop them from feeling the pain of their flesh being torn into by a wolf. Mm. And so fear of worse consequences caused us to inflict the pain we were trying to save our children from. Now, that's not to say that the wolf isn't real. Mm. Of course, the wolf is real. Mm -hmm. And it may be effective. It may be an effective deterrent in that moment. But we've now created a different type of trauma, a different type of damage. We swapped the wolves for the coyote. And the coyote is us. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? So we, we, we are, are switching damage. We are just playing this three-card Monty with different types of trauma as long as you don't die is the standard It's just don't die. Right. You see what I'm saying? And so that's, that's one of the, you know, whoop you so the white man won't. Well, you know what? <laughs> it's still a whooping. Okay. But it's a whooping that doesn't end with a loss of your life. How mm -hmm. about that? Right. And so, so I get it. We're, we're intending love. We intend protection. We, in, we intend preservation when we do certain things, um, when we allow people to put, you know, raisins and grapes in our potato salad and apple slices and walnuts. <laughs> in the potato salad? Violence. Yes. You know, I get what we're trying to do, but we have to hold the line and have a standard and level up to meet that that standard, like improve ourselves as our conditions change, create new traditions. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that nonviolence or some subscription to nonviolent 
um, parenting. I believe that there's a way that we can do this um, that doesn't require us to resort to the barbarism that we're trying to save ourselves from. So I want to ask you, as um, as you're talking about upholding um, a tradition and upholding uh, practices, uh-huh. positive ones, not mm-hmm. the, the corporal punishment ones, um, I'm thinking of one thing that I see and I have seen often um, on the internet and on, on travel shows, for example. So you've probably seen this before, too. It's like the... The host of the show, usually a white male, um, Mm -hmm. will go to the low country, South Carolina, and Mm -hmm. they'll discover all, uncover all of the interesting uh, parts of the cuisine of Geechee culture. Mm -hmm. Um, They'll talk about these traditions. They'll talk about the language. And it always struck me as odd because I always think like, it's it's still this white person from outside of the culture coming into the culture to uncover something that is in already in plain sight you know right. and um i always think that that paints a very inauthentic picture of what the culture uh, an inauthentic picture of what the culture represents and who the people truly are in this culture and I think what ends up happening is that people do hear Gullah Geechee and they think it's like a mystical magical like Brigadoon type of existence for you know in in America so my question Mm. really is as outsiders as people who want to experience the culture or want to um, engage with the culture in some way how can we do that responsibly? How can we do that without tokenizing or without making it seem like Gullah Geechee is something to be uncovered and something mystical and something, um, you know, how, how can we relate to it authentically without, you know, tokenizing, without making right. it seem like it's uh, something for the taking? I think that one aspect of it is, um, well, okay, there's, there's, there's two answers. Um, if you're talking about media versus the, the average person, when you say we, um, my brain automatically creates categories of we. <laughs> 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 so I'm like, you know, okay, it depends on which we we talk about, but, but there's different categories of we um, because there are things that I would be more open to if a person is just a civilian. You're just a regular person off the street, curious about something. Um, There are conversations I would have with that person that I probably wouldn't have if they were media. If, like, you should know better. Like, if, if, if you're someone who's in a position, especially if you're going to commoditize the thing that, that I'm telling you about, if you're going to somehow turn the thing that I've done into a product. Um, we got a different kind of conversation to have than if you're just, you know, Bob and Jen coming down to visit and wanted to know where they can get some good authentic gullah, mm-hmm. you know, food or whatever. Um, you know, I get stuff like that all the time, you know, um, that's cool. But when you're some of the media companies who already have your you already have your mind made up you already have what it is you're you're coming to cover you know what it is you're looking to do now you don't know much about Gullah Geechee people but you already know how you intend to present them before you even meet one Mm. and that's a problem if by the time you already you have a discussion with me you say oh yeah we were looking to do a feature on Gullah Geechee people about xyz based on abc Mm -hmm. and i'm like Okay, but what about DEF? Well, we're not going to cover DEF. That's you know, so that, that's a separate thing. That's not really our our in our wheelhouse. It's not really what we do. But you know, I'll I'll you know, we'll let's bracket that. Let's bracket that. We'll bracket that for later and maybe you know circle back around to that. 
you're not circling around to it because that's not what you do. Right. You know, well, we really focus more on the, this aspect of things. And we were trying to see how that could fit into this. And I'm like, how about if it doesn't fit into the thing you do, you just find something that does. Right. Instead of trying to contort, twist and distort this into the product that you want it to be, why don't you just go ahead and present it for what it is or move on to something that's in your wheelhouse? Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to help you misrepresent the culture. Right. All right. There's a very narrow straight of how the media intends to present Gullah Geechee culture. If it isn't already obvious, it's, it should be clear by now. Like, okay, food, it's going to be food. When you start talking about Gullah Geechee culture, it is going to be food Mm -hmm. and or painting slash weaving. Hmm. So it's going to be in the art. And I don't mean when I say painting, I don't mean a wide variety of artistic styles. There's a very specific look that they're looking for with the styles. Now, of course, I'm not going to name names, but they're very, there's a very specific style that they're looking for, for Gullah art. Mm -hmm. And if you were an artist and that ain't your style, they don't count you as a Gullah artist. Wow. Okay. Because your style is not, you know, in alignment with the, 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 the thing that they have an appetite for. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know artists who have, oh man, that just, just, just the, the visuals, just the stuff that they do is just so dope, but it's not that look. Mm-hmm. I know people who are crafts, crafts persons who do, but it's not basket weaving. So because you're not basket weaving, then you don't really count as a Gullah artisan. Mm-hmm. You know, or a Palmetto Rose, we'll take that. Although we're trying to figure out ways to demonize and criminalize the kids who do those things. Um, we're not going to count that. Mm-hmm. If, it's, if you're a cook, God bless the Gullah Geechee sushi chef. <laughs> You don't count. You know, it's a very specific type of way, specific type of food that you, you thing you need to do mm-hmm. in order to count. But if you're a Gullah Geechee graphic designer, mm-hmm. you don't count as an artist. If you're a, a, a Gullah Geechee performer or singer who doesn't sing certain traditional styles traditional songs or whatever, then you don't count as strictly in the, as a Gullah Geechee act. You might be a, an act of Gullah Geechee descent, mm. but you're not necessarily a Gullah Geechee artist. Mm-hmm. In the minds of people, if you're, un, unless you're like maybe a ring shouter, then you count because you can present that traditional look and sound that there's an appetite for, but who are we doing that for? Mm-hmm. Are we doing that for ourselves? Are we doing that for the Bakradim mm-hmm. and their gays? Because in the community, there are times when Gullah Geechee people will look at another Gullah Geechee people like, man, keep still. Like, you're doing too much. Mm. Everybody know that's performative. That ain't how you talk. And that's not how you even do the thing when you're doing or whatever. You're doing that because of because the buck with them around. Mm-hmm. You're doing that for them, boy. That, that's that's what you're doing that for. And when they become the tastemakers, mm-hmm. when you let other people become the tastemakers, you find yourself taking out certain ingredients in your food that might offend them. And now all of a sudden, look at your traditional dish. Is that still the traditional dish at all when you let them dictate? There are some people that if you go to certain Italian restaurants and you ask them for certain things, they will usher you to the door. We don't do that. Mm. 
If you say, hey, can I get that you know, pizza with some pineapples on it? Then, bro, you got to get up out here. Beat it. <laughs> you got to go, bro. There's certain, certain things that a, 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 an authentic Italian restaurant ain't going to serve you. And you might get a, a, a cooking lesson at your table before even asking. Mm-hmm. We often, on the other hand, say, oh, you don't like this and that? We'll take it out. You don't want it? Okay, hold the, you know, you can get the gumbo, hold the okra. Hold the okra? How you can hold the okra? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, yeah, we're gonna get the you know the the the, the Hobbit John no hold the beans, no beans, you know what you know, what we're gonna we do Hobbit John with lentils. Oh, Bro, we're not doing Hobbit John with lentils, man. Quit playing. <laughs> <laughs> Stop, call it something else. Right. And so that's the thing is we keep form fitting and shaping and twisting our presentation and performance of Gullah geechee for people who are not Gullah Geechee. And the thing is, the problem with that, among other things, is that people who are coming into their own as Gullah Geechee people, maybe young people who are growing up, you know, coming up, who, who don't know exactly what it means to be Gullah Geechee, see the most popular presentations of it, and then they start to emulate that. Right. And so, ironically, the emulation of things that are reflections of outside tastes and and, and outside uh, opinions ends up shaping what is authentic Gullah Geechee. Because now that next generation that grew up on um, that processed presentation of who we were, that to them, that's real. Mm. Now that is what it is. It the, the 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 it has become the reality of who we are and what we do and how we present ourselves to the world. And so, to me, that's why in you know, I, it's not that I. I mean, I have you know traditional African garments right right there. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm I mean, I'm not exactly adverse to you know African culture, or whatever, um, as well. But I also ride a skateboard. Mm. I also wear jeans and vans and, you know, like I, I also like wear stuff that is not necessarily traditional garb all the time. And the reason being, other than the fact that I just feel like doing it, mm. um, is because I don't want most of my viewers and my my listeners and, and particularly because I teach young kids as well. I don't know how many people know that, but it's not I'm not just teaching at Harvard, but also with young kids, including with Harvard Project Teach, where I end up, um, you know, doing classes with seventh graders, but I also teach in the community, younger kids. And, you know, I show up looking like they do. Show up wearing the same sneakers they wear, the same jeans they wear, like in the same stuff. Like, not, I'm not like I have a, a pan complex. <laughs> 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 I don't show up looking crazy, but I'm saying it is in a general sense, um, they see a presentation of Gullah Geechee culture that looks like them, mm. sounds like them, talks like them. They don't feel alienated from their own culture. Mm -hmm. If the only thing they ever see is out of reach because they do not have the money to be able to afford a good fugu. And they'll get clowned if they wear one of the dashikis that you can get from a dollar store or the one of the... The, the 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 less expensive Chinese made dashikis you'll get clown, but you can't even afford anything other than that five ten dollar dashiki. Mm -hmm. So if you don't wear that because you know the 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 people in the culture will clown you and you can't afford um, one of the more traditional authentic ones, you are gonna wear what you got. Right. Your traditional you know uh, gear might be a white tee, it might be a t shirt or a jersey or whatever. That's what you got. And you know what? You ain't no less Gullah Geechee than the person who can afford those traditional garments. Mm -hmm. I knew I couldn't. I know my, my mama couldn't afford. I've gone out looking for um for African traditional um African wear and all of that. Um, and no shade at the um at the vendors because you, you gotta get your money and and what it's worth. So you 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 do that. But I know that my family, we grew up generationally poor and would not have been able to afford them. Mm -hmm. And so we made our own clothes. Right. 
You know, it literally made our own clothes. My mom would make the clothes. And what we couldn't make, we would end up getting from whatever source we could get, whether it was secondhand or new in the store or wherever we could get it, we did what we could. And so it, representation matters, but we have to start thinking in terms of what it is that we're representing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like just yeah. putting a black face on it is not enough. It's the whole embodiment um, of the culture and who you're representing. So mm -hmm. that's what I, I, you know, I try to do in regards to these traditions, but you know what? Traditions are not simply past tense. Mm -hmm. Create some new ones. Right, right. We can do that. Yeah. I think in the vein of uh, representation and in the vein of being this activist and positive voice that you are for your culture. I would love it if you could tell everyone listening where we can find you, where we can uh, engage with your social content and with your teachings. I appreciate that. Um, the, the fastest way, uh, most convenient way to, to find me online um, would just be sunmashow.com and that's S-U-N-N-M-C-H-E-A-U-X. For those who, who ask, a lot. Um, it's Michelle. Like imagine the name Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Like imagine Michelle, but instead of shell, say show, like Michelle. There it is. Um, because I've heard a lot. Like I've heard make ho, <laughs> uh, mcho, or you know, mchu or chucks or whatever, like that. Nope, it's Michelle. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so sunmichelle.com will get you. Uh, you know, my bio and some of my content or whatever, but it also gets you to my social media pages. Um, you know, you, there'll be a tab there um, for my TikTok, for my Instagram, for my um, Facebook and my Twitter and YouTube. There'll be a, um, a link there for that. Um, but mostly if you look me up under um, Sun Michelle or at Sun Michelle, you will find my um, my social media uh, pages there. Uh, so the content varies depending. There's a lot of duplication <laughs> of content depending on, on the things. So you'll see some of that. But then also things are a little bit differently. I've been getting a little spicy on TikTok lately because somebody. I <laughs> <laughs> have to because it's, you know. People wild out there. Like they really, yeah. really are doing the most. And so depending on the format you catch me on, you might get a different, you know, different <laughs> side of me. Um, but yeah, you know, you, you, holler at me on, uh, on, um, on, on, on TikTok and, um, on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, they're all at Sun Michelle. Um, and I believe my, um, you can find my YouTube there as well. Um, and engage, I would suggest that you engage, like, don't, don't, don't think that, um, if you leave a comment, um, good or bad, that you won't get a response. <laughs> <laughs> If it's engagement you want, you know, however you want to do it, you know, I'm with it. You're going to get it. So. You're going to get it, you know. So, yeah. So, do that. So, come around. Like, you know, definitely let's have a conversation about it. Um, I really, really want to make sure that there's not only understanding from the people within the community, but also throughout the diaspora that we have more things in common. Uh, we're more alike than unalike. And um, so, I'm always, it's always wonderful for me when people from throughout the diaspora see things that they recognize in our culture and the lessons and um, the presentations of the culture, whatever. And also one of the things that I enjoy the most is being able to bridge those generation, uh, that generation gap with, to, to, you know, I'm honored and privileged and just really overjoyed to be able to have very young kids and mm -hmm. also elders all enjoy the same content. Yeah. So. I am a big fan of your content and I, I look forward to it whenever I see it because I know I'm going to learn something and I know that it's going to be entertaining. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's more serious, but you know, it, that's just the nature of social media. I think right. it's like, right. but I think that you're so creative. And I was actually thinking the other day, like, how does he come up with this? Because it's like, I, I feel like I'm a creative person, but when I have to like, like make a skit or something, I'm like, yeah oh god i don't really know like what i'm doing but i think that you you have the perfect tone for that and i think that you you have a really fantastic balance between what's serious what's educational and what's entertaining and what i will do for people who want to engage mm -hmm. um i will add your information and all your links to your platforms in the show notes so that mm -hmm. listeners can click right away and and find you and uh take part in what you're in what you're doing. 
I appreciate that. And, and I would like to say that, you know, likewise, um, that your content is fascinating to me in a way that, um, you know, when you have so much access to so much content with mm -hmm. effects and apps and filters and, you know, people can create like, you know, big studio films in their backyard and all on their phone like this. There's just so much out there. Um, the ability to be able to sit and listen mm. and enjoy conversation. Um, as you could probably tell, I maybe talk a little too much. Like you'll, you'll never entertain, you'll never interview me and not get enough content. You like <laughs> You might have to edit it down, but it won't be like, man, he's so, you know, closed up. He won't answer my question, yes. you know, <laughs> but to be able to listen to, um, to your content. Cause, uh, when we were first, uh, came in contact, what's one of the things that I wanted to do was, um, you know, listen to more. I think we both did the same thing. Listen to more, um, check out more of uh, one another's content. And, um, I think that your style, of of, conver of conversing and engaging and mining out information and and packaging that in a way that makes it um, accessible uh, to your audience um, is very impressive and fascinating. And I was excited to be able to accept your um, your invitation to sit and talk. And I also think that um, just you being a black woman in this mm. field. Um, you know, there's not like a big production crew behind you pulling strings and doing all of this stuff. I mean, you're, you're a, a woman who's, uh, you know, single handedly carving your own path and doing these things that, um, deserves support and profile on, and, and in a higher profile and, and for more people to know. So if there's anything that my audience or whatever platform that I have, can um, likewise lend to expanding your audience and, and turning more people on to you, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm always eager to do that um, in general, but especially as it pertains to uh, Black women. I think that if in the event that this world listened to you more, <laughs> damn it, <laughs> and you were higher profile and, and dictated the conversation more right. we would be in a different um position and and so every time i get the chance to do that with someone who's on the grind and doing what you're doing i try to seize the opportunity um to be as supportive as possible and so i'm looking forward to not only being able to converse with your audience and and but also hoping that my audience anyone who's under the, the sound of my voice now and who appreciates what i do um, to know that I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't believe wholeheartedly in what you're doing and that anyone who follows me that you deserve their follow as well. Um, and, you. and, you know, and so that that's something that I'm glad we were able to sit down on this fine uh, evening <laughs> and, um, and be able to have a conversation. So I really, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And um, I have to say this conversation could easily go on for a few more hours. Right. Um, so either you'll have to come back. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> or, um, yeah, you'll just have to come back. That's this. I'm yeah, not giving you an yeah. option. You're, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. you're more than welcome anytime. We didn't even talk about, we didn't even talk about spirituality. I'm going to hold that for the next episode. I yeah. think for the next time that we talk, <laughs> um, that'll be, that'll be something that I'm going to, cause you've already given me so much food for thought. Um, right. I'm going to go back and do another round of researching and learning as okay. I encourage my listeners to do as well, because that's what the show is about learning from one another. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. Like, I cannot thank you enough for this conversation. And I've really enjoyed listening to your stories and and listening to the knowledge that you have on your culture. And I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. You're more than welcome. I like to end each episode with the same question on a light mm -hmm. note. <laughs> mm -hmm. Every episode, I this is my final question. Do you have any jokes, tongue twisters, slang words, idioms, words of wisdom or words of advice in Gullah Geechee to share? Um, 
there is a joke, but it's it's a it's a long one, so I'll I'll spare you that one. Okay. Um, but there's a a, a Gullah Geechee, um, you know, adage that you know, for heal a tree, you must take care of the root. Mm. Um, that's one of those things that I think is always, uh, per, it's it's just always relevant that in order to uh, th- survive and thrive as a people, as a culture, as a community. Um, we have to preserve um, where we came from and allow that to be the foundation of where we we go from here. Mm-hmm. So um, that would be the one that uh, that comes to mind. And fear the tree, you must take care of the root. For heal the tree, you must take care of the root. Yeah. Okay. I always I have to repeat after every everyone who gives me a, a word or a saying, I got to say it too because that's part of learning, right? right. It's like right. repetition. So. I like to put myself in the hot seat and try, <laughs> try right, to right. say it, no matter what language it is. Right. Um, thank you again so much. And I want to just one final thing. Um, we've been talking for quite a while. Right. And let's say we are in South Carolina and we are parting ways. Mm-hmm. And we'll see each other at some point again. Uh, in this situation, what would be the best way to say goodbye? Um, in this case, I would um, probably say, you know, you know, okay, then hold them down, you know, as a hold them down, you know, um, would probably be because because I intend because we intend to speak again, and so it's not like a final goodbye. So mm-hmm. there's a, a familiar sort of goodbye in where I don't intend to see you again, or we might not see each other again. And then there's a type of goodbye um, where it's a see you later um, sort of thing with someone who's familiar with you. Um, and so I just say, you know, okay, then, then, you know, I right, didn't hold them down. I like that. I like yeah. that. I wonder where that comes from, like horses, maybe. Uh, there's, the, again, it, it, a lot of them with the, uh, the, the task of things that you would uh, be charged with with controlling or holding down, mm. whether it's um, horses or steed or cattle or whatever the thing may be um, that you're having to maintain, um, you know, control and order, um, you know, as a part of a task. So um, hold them down would be like, you know, okay, be easy, take care of, um, take care mm-hmm. is like, essentially it's like the same thing as take care. Mm. I like that one. I may, I may work that into my daily life (laughs) for myself. (laughs) Well, thank you again so much. And I will be talking to you soon. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.